You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, Brian McClanahan, and this is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is the week covering December 21st to December 25th, 2015, so Christmas week. So we have a short uh, podcast for this week. I'm uh, just going to cover the, the few pieces we had on the website this week. One is actually a reprint from last year, but it's still so good that uh, we needed to run it again. Uh, just to uh, remind everyone that we have our conference coming up February 26th and 27th, 2016 in Charleston, South Carolina. The topic is the PC attack on the South. We'd love to see you there. Please register on our website, www.abbevilleinstitute.org. Also remember that the Abbeville Institute does exist on your tax-deductible contributions. The end of the year is coming up, so please consider donating to the Institute. You keep this podcast going, the website going, the programs, the summer schools, all the things that we try to do to help explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. You can find out more information on that at our website, www.abbevilleinstitute.org. Go to the top of the page, and you'll see a tab for Donate. Uh, so you can scroll down there, and have, and it has a memberships for individuals. If you want to uh, donate as a business or give stock, there's other options available as well. So please consider uh, donating. A, a, a membership is $50 for the year, so that's less than uh, 5 bucks a month. And uh, it's, it's a great way to help us continue to do what we're doing in this uh, process and trying to beat back these PC attacks, which have now become more pronounced than ever before. We need the Abbeville Institute. Uh, So uh, this week, one thing we missed last week, and uh, I talked about the birthday of John Taylor of Caroline in our podcast, uh, but there was another great birthday that week as well, and someone who was just as prominent in the old Republican circles, in fact, maybe more prominent in terms of his political clout, and that was Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina. He also had a birthday uh, last week, and he's one of my favorites in the founding generation. My, my, uh, the best story, I think, that, that really shows what Macon thought about spending money. Uh, when he was in the Congress, there was a bill presented to build a statue of George Washington, and the statue would cost around 100000 current dollars. And Macon opposed it. And he didn't oppose it because he didn't like George Washington. In fact, he loved George Washington. But he thought $100,000 of current dollars was too much to spend on a statue for George Washington. Now, how many times? We just had this omnibus bill that passed through the Congress, a you know, $2 trillion spending bill full of pork and all kinds of special projects and other things. How many people would oppose $100,000? But Nathaniel Macon did. And so he was a great um, patriot, served in the American War for Independence, a steward of the uh, taxpayers' money, a uh, firm believer in the original Constitution, uh, supported, he did not support nullification, but he supported secession. He didn't support nullification because he thought that was silly. You should just secede if you didn't like the Union. Uh, and of course, he opposed the ratification of the Constitution in 1788. Uh, but eventually served in the in the U.S. Congress from North Carolina. He called his plantation Buck Spring his country, and he checked his mail once a month. Now, again, how many of us would love to check our mail only once a month? He had a chapel on his plantation that uh, served both uh, his uh, religious needs and also that of his, of his slaves. Uh, he is still buried on that property under Flint. Uh, He covered his grave in Flint, and actually before he died, he paid the undertaker. He knew he was dying that day and paid the undertaker, made sure he left no debts behind. Uh, He provided food and grog for everyone to attend his uh, his wake. And so he's a really interesting guy, well-known for Macon's Bill, uh, number two and number one. Uh, Macon's Bill number two, of course, the one that uh, ultimately led to the War of 1812, at least partially because uh, of Napoleon's deception. If you don't know that story, uh, Macon wanted the United States to choose a side, whether it was going to be the British or the French. And Napoleon uh, picked up on this and told his foreign minister to tell the United States, hey, look, we're, we're going we're gonna to side with the U.S. So the United States imposed harsher sanctions on British shipping and commerce when the French had no intention of being good guys and really cooperating with the United States. And so after that happened, uh, the British increased their blockade continued impressing American sailors, and eventually uh, that, that spilled over to the War of 1812. But that wasn't Macon's fault. That was poor diplomacy on the, on the part of the Madison administration. It had nothing to do with Macon. 
Uh, but a great defender of the Constitution, someone you should uh, certainly uh, read about. Uh, there's a number of uh, great books on Macon. There's some out there for free uh, on the web. There are you know, 19th century works on Nathaniel Macon. Uh, there's Norman Risdor's The Old Republicans, where he talks about Nathaniel Macon. I wrote about Macon in my uh, Politically Incorrect Guide to the Founding Fathers. So uh, Macon is, is one of these people that you should know, uh, but most people don't know who he is, and that's unfortunate. But again, he had a birthday last week, so just wanted to mention him as well as John, uh, John Taylor of Caroline. Uh, both great uh, old Republicans in the, in the Southern tradition, in the old Republican tradition. Okay, so this week we had a, a few, uh, a couple of short pieces, two pieces uh, dedicated to uh, Christmas itself. And the first piece of the week was entitled A Tale of Two Plantations. It's about uh, Mount Vernon and Arlington and, and how these two plantations fared during the War for Southern Independence uh, in, in the 1860s. And uh, it talks about how in the 1850s a woman named Anne Pamela Cunningham, of course this, this article is written by Karen Stokes, she's written for us a number of times and has also written on... Uh, on, on uh, Mount Vernon before, but uh, the fact in the, the 1850s, a woman named Ann Pamela Cunningham uh, from South Carolina uh, founded the uh, Mount Vernon Ladies Association, and that fought to preserve Mount Vernon. And of course, during the war itself, it was preserved, virtually untouched, even though the last man to live in Mount Vernon uh, was John Augustine Washington, and he actually served as a colonel in the Confederate Army. Uh, but uh, Mount Vernon was not touched during the war because it was seen as a uh, relic of the United States as a nation, not of the South, even though the South had more had a more vested interest in uh, Mount Vernon than anyone in the North ever did. And of course, one of the things that really is tragic about Mount Vernon and, and the Lees, and they're, they're tied together, as, as everyone I'm sure is aware, uh, the fact that uh, Robert E. Lee was married into the Washington family, uh, the fact that a number of the artifacts that were at Arlington from Mount Vernon, from George Washington himself, uh, were confiscated by the Union Army and then uh, brought to Washington, D.C., almost as conquered uh, you know, treasure, uh, captured treasure by the Union Army. And then Arlington suffered the terrible fate of being a cemetery, which everyone knows that that's what it is today. But this was done on purpose, uh, and uh, when Arlington was uh, seized by federal troops, Mrs. Lee wrote, uh, they were planted up to the door without any regard for common decency. And she's talking about the dead. And by the end of the war, thousands of soldiers were buried around her former home. So this is because to Northerners, Arlington House, even though it had a grand history, uh, was the symbol of secession. No more so than Mount Vernon was a symbol of secession, and the South recognized that, that George Washington himself was a symbol of secession. The North thought otherwise. To the North, he was a symbol of the nation. And there's this great debate about whether Washington would have supported secession or not. No one, of course, can say for sure if he would have if he wouldn't have. Uh, there are, I just read an article not long ago saying that Washington, of course, would have opposed secession because he opposed every kind of, uh, every, every bit of talk like this uh, before he became president and uh, this is why he supported the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. So he would have definitely been opposed to secession had he still been alive in 1861. Well, no one knows for certain if he would have or not. Uh, if you're looking at the situation in 1861, was it similar to what happened in 1775 or 1776? I think without question you can say that the two, uh, the two wars had a lot of similarities and they were parallel in many ways. So uh, the Confederacy certainly invoked Washington's image on their seal, the Confederate state seal. And as I mentioned before, his own descendants <laughs> fought for the Confederacy. Uh, so it's hard to say that Washington would not have supported the Confederacy any more than it would have said that he, he would have supported the Union. So it's an interesting debate, but of course the two plantations had different trajectories in terms of how they were preserved during the war itself. And, and Miss Stokes does a very good job of explaining how one was ruined and one was preserved uh, you can still go to Arlington House today, of course, but a lot of the grand old artifacts are gone, uh, taken by the Union Army and, and destroyed or used as uh, items of, uh, of treasure. Okay, the, uh, on Tuesday we uh, featured a poem uh, by Catherine Savage Brossman, uh, and the title of that is For the Paris Dead, and this is on the heels of the terrible events in Paris of a few weeks ago when you had uh, 
the uh, mass shooting there. And um, I'm going to read the poem. It's not very long, uh, but and it's not necessarily on a southern theme, so to speak. Uh, it is on a Western civilization theme, and I think that you can draw parallels between the attacks on the South and the and how what's going to happen to Western civilization should this continue, uh, because the South is an integral part of Western civilization, and the attacks that are coming are at the hands of, of uh, Islam, radical Islam, and other things, are, are simply an attack on Western civilization. So this is why we published the poem. Uh, Miss Brosman, of course, has been the poetry editor for Chronicles Magazine, and Tom Fleming, uh, she is a native of Louisiana. Uh, so, uh, here we go. It's for the Paris dead. The Wehrmacht coveted the wealth of France, its grain, vines, ports, its past, and Paris most of all. They planned and took their shining chance. Admiring it, they didn't want its ghost or ruins. They, too, were Franks. Lieben wie gotten Frankreich was their watchword. Notre Dame, the Eiffel Tower, Concord, the Louvre besought them. Vital presence, history, art. The bomb that struck St. Severin was not a deed of mad misogynist fanatics born to hate, dehumanized by their own creed, with Allah's blessing, cruel puppets sworn to murder or convert. We see too well how new attackers want the West to rot. They'd kill the culture with the infidel. It's foolish to be nice. De Gaulle was not, nor Patton, nor was Charles Martel, who drove the Zarazins from Tours. Quite nasty work, essential though. Nor John, the king who strove for Christendom and won against the Turk. Past errors stain us, but do not excuse today's. And suicide remains a crime. The dead require a stand. Who could refuse? Requite them and save France while there's still time. On Wednesday, we published the 23rd installment of Clyde Wilson's saying, Buyer for Southerners. And uh, there's a few good ones in this, and the picture was of Winston Churchill. And, of course, these aren't always by Southerners. Churchill was not a Southerner. He's, uh, but um, the sayings are prescient for Southerners, so... Uh, Churchill said the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with an average voter. And he also said democracy is the worst form of government, except for every other kind that has been tried. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> an English traveler in 1910 said the South is by a long way the most simply and sincerely a religious country than I was ever in. It is a country in which religion is a very large factor in life and God is very real and personal. The abolitionist Wendell Phillips said, Virginia is a pirate ship, and John Brown sails the sea as a Lord High Admiral of the Almighty with his commission to sink every pirate he meets on God's ocean. And this gets to the point that John Brown was revered as a messiah in the North, uh, not as a fanatic. <clears throat> Faulkner said, The past is never dead. It's not even, the, it's not even past. And the poet... Miller Williams said, Southerners live in the past. Not so. The past continues to live in Southerners. On Thursday, we reran a piece by Gail Jarvis. It's um, a Christmas story for the Old South, and it focuses on William Gilmore Sims' A Golden Christmas, which uh, Gail Jarvis said he reads every Christmas. And, of course, we can go through the holidays reading A Christmas Carol or uh, the Gift of the Magi, uh, but uh, Mr. Jarvis says he reads A Golden Christmas because it's more appropriate for a Southerner, and you can get this book for free, uh, but a couple of things I want to point out in this piece, and we reran it. Uh, it was published uh, in the Can uh, Canadian Free Press, and then uh, we published it last year ourselves, and I reran it uh, on Thursday of this uh, last week on Christmas Eve, but there's a couple of things that uh, Jarvis points out in this particular piece uh, about why this book is important because it, it, it speaks to the difference between a southern Christmas and a northern Christmas. And the reason Sims wrote the book is because 
Sims, as Jarvis says, was concerned that the memory of those times would slip away, and this is how Sims described them. He said there were tokens and trophies of the past which have not entirely passed away, but these tokens no longer exhibit the usual vitality, though they refrain, I'm sorry, they retain the familiar form. Their traces may be likened to the withered rose leaves in your old cabinet that still faintly appeal to the senses, but rather recall what they cannot restore and pain you by the contrast they force upon you, rather than compensate you by their still lingering sweetness. Sims was writing about Charleston in the 1850s and what Christmas was like there. And I'm going to contrast this with the next piece, because this is the 1850s in Charleston, before the war. And he takes us down King Street and Queen Street, shopping to browse through Carrison's, which is a department store in Charleston, and John Russell's bookstore, that sold books, paintings, and other things. And the Golden Christmas is about the aristocracy in the South and how they enjoyed Christmas. And the aristocrats in Sim's story participated in a Christmas that is really unlike modern Christmas today. And this is what Jarvis says about that. He says, quote, Today we regard Christmas as a holiday primarily for children, with Santa Claus bringing gifts. But the festivities of the South Carolina Christmas season that Sims depicts were chiefly for adults. Kissing under the mistletoe and other more grown-up amorous pursuits were a common practice during the Yuletide reveling. And in accordance with the English tradition, there is the appearance of Father Christmas, who was also associated with adult celebrations, encouraging merriment to celebrate Christ's birth. It was essentially the puritanical New Englanders that limited Christmas only to children. Their feeling was that adults should avoid frivolity and conduct themselves in a sedate manner. Their celebrations featured the Dutch St. Nicholas instead of England's Father Christmas. And so he talks about how this pastime begins in South Carolina, all the feasting and drinking and merriment that goes on, Uh, the fact that the eggnog was spiked with Jamaican rum and cognac, Uh, that people had a grand time, the adults. And uh, even that uh, Christmas was uh, the holiday not only for the aristocracy in in South Carolina, but also for the slaves as well. And they were given the time off and treated to gifts uh, on the plantation. This is something that would be shocking to the modern reader. My gosh, you mean that these people actually uh, were part of the celebration? They were considered humans? Well, of course. Uh, They were, and all throughout the South you find this. But, uh, of course, the modern PC narrative would not have you believe this, but if you read any of the the literature from the time period, uh, you'll find that that was the case. Even things like 12 Years a Slave talks about this and how Christmas was so celebrated in the South for everyone, black and white, slave and non-slave. Uh, and Jarvis goes on to say, The characterization in the Golden Christmas, as in other Sims' stories, are consistent with the idiom of their time and place. So some aspects of his stories clash with today's social mores. Consequently, William Gilmore Sims is largely spurned by the literary establishment. But his stories luckily have not been subjected to the ethnic cleansing that sterilized the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and the enduring songs of Stephen Foster. You can, you can still read Sims. You can still read the original Huckleberry Finn and the original Stephen Foster tombs. But uh, it's important to, to grasp that there was a difference between Christmas in the North and the South, and now it's become this quote-unquote national-type holiday. Uh, but the way that people in the South used to celebrate Christmas was different than in the North. And this was the case with many traditions throughout the United States. One that's quite interesting uh, in, in looking at the way people used to celebrate uh, holidays If you were a Democratic Republican, you often celebrated the 4th of July. If you were a Federalist, you celebrated Washington's birthday. Now, both, of course, uh, have Southern roots. Uh, But, you know, we we look at these things and say, well, I mean, you know, everyone celebrates uh, Washington's birthday or the 4th of July, but it wasn't always the case. Uh, In fact, July 4th and after the war was not even celebrated in some parts of the South for years because of the terrible damage done uh, along the Mississippi River by the Union Army uh, on the 4th of July. Uh, so for years, Southerners stopped celebrating July 4th, uh, and it was only many years later that it actually came back into fashion to celebrate the 4th of July. But we have to remember what the 4th of July really is, and it's celebrating secession. Uh, so 
it's amazing how the North continued to think that this was somehow uh, acceptable to celebrate this holiday that promotes the same thing the South was fighting for between 61 and 65. Uh, but the South recognized it as, you know, because the North distorted the meaning of it, and now it's just hot dogs and ball games and uh, rah-rah for the, uh, for the uh, national military. Uh, but for a time, this was a holiday that celebrated independence. It was about secession and the, and, and the uh, independence of the uh, these United States from Great Britain in 1776. Many of the states declaring the independence separately, uh, rather than um, uh, just uh, under the Declaration of Independence. So it's amazing how holidays, you know, find favor in North and South, and how they're celebrated differently, and how they're thought of differently. Uh, there was a cultural identity. Uh, North and South, it's really been erased, uh, without question. Uh, you know, everyone in America celebrates Christmas generally the same, and now the debate is whether it's a Christian holiday or a secular holiday, and there aren't these distinctive uh, cultural pieces to it, one from the North, one from the South. That's just ignored. Uh, but the way people celebrate Christmas uh, in the United States, the way people celebrated Christmas in the United States was, was often different North and South. And finally, so we have this, this article about Christmas in the South in the 1850s and how it was this time of merriment and grog and food and feasting and a grand time. And then uh, on Christmas Day, we published a piece, Christmas in Richmond, 1864. And it was from uh, Mrs. Uh, Verena Davis's recollections of life in the South in Richmond in 1864 and how poor it was and, and all the suffering in Richmond. Here we are, 1864, the height of the war, and how uh, there are so many orphans in Richmond because so many men had been killed. We've been at war now for three years. And how the Davises were making uh, makeshift toys for the orphans. They were having to recycle toys because they couldn't get new ones. They didn't have the materials to make new toys, uh, so they had to recycle toys um, uh, things like uh, you know monkeys with all the squeak gong, rubber tops, all kinds of things that they could just get. Eyeless dolls, three-legged horses, toys with the upper peg broken off, tops with the upper peg broken off, excuse me, things that they could just get to try to refurbish so that they could provide toys to orphans. And again, this speaks to the, to the charity of the Davises, to the charity, the Christian charity of Christmas, and what it is about uh, that they were concerned about people that had lost it all during this war, the suffering. And they had a party, a uh, Christmas Eve party. Again, uh, the things that they would get at Christmas did not m match what they would have had just uh, five years before this. And uh, the wealth of the South had been sapped. Uh, the energy of the South had been sapped. Uh, and um, a, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I read a poem by uh, Tim Rod, which was entitled Christmas. And it got to this, how, how the... The image of Christmas had been changed during the war because there was so much suffering. But it was Christian charity that kept the Davises alive and it kept, it kept them thinking of the people around them at Christmas. And how important the idea of Christian charity still was, even in this time of misery. And they closed the night with what they called a starvation party. There are no refreshments. The rooms lighted as well as practicable, some willing to play dance music on the piano, and plenty of young men and girls comprised the entertainment. But they didn't have any food. Because of all the people that were suffering. These young people are gray-haired now, but the lessons of self-denial, industry, and frugality in which they became past mistresses then have made them, made of them the most dignified, self-reliant, and tender women I have ever known. All honor to them. So people were suffering, and they were giving up everything for the cause of the war. And that's something that, um, yeah, even in the American War for Independence, so many people suffered. How much they gave up for that cause of independence. And, and people wonder why, after the war was over, the South was so bitter and why there was uh, an effort to rekindle what the South actually stood for in this cause for independence. It was no lost cause. To them, this burned as bright as it did in 1861, and the principles were still there. You can look at the causes of secession or the 
you know, the, the political economy of the South or whatever. But the principle was independence. The idea that they could declare their independence, the secession was legal r- regardless. I mean, the British said that the, uh, the United States was fighting for slavery in 1776. There were slaveholding states. Uh, the British had actually uh, issued a, or the governor of Virginia uh, issued a proclamation freeing slaves in Virginia uh, during the war. So the British were saying the war was all about slavery. And why is that not talked about now? And so here you have a situation where the South is pushing, after all the suffering, the countless widows and orphans and uh, you know mothers losing sons, uh, people losing all, everything they had, every bit of wealth, their property, and, and, and every bit of their culture was being destroyed by an invading army. And so, of course, they're going to hang on to this idea that this was independence, that they were seeking. The principles were the same in 1776 as they were in 1861. And that's something we have to remember. Mount Vernon to Arlington. Christmas 50 in the 1850s, 1864. The suffering that people went through in 1864 at Christmas time, and what the Davises were willing to do to try to provide for these people, and what they were willing to do after the war was over, to promote the cause for which all of these people bled and died for, and even those who didn't bleed and die, the women of the South who suffered. It must be remembered that Robert E. Lee's daughters never married. They were damaged by the war, irreparably damaged by the war, socially, uh, not physically, but socially and emotionally by the war. So were many people across the South. It was a sad time. We're getting into the sesquicentennial now of Reconstruction, and it's something we need to talk about more because the lost cause, so-called lost cause, which is not a myth because what they were talking about really was is what they believed they were fighting for in 60 to 65, independence. That lost cause was born out of the suffering of Reconstruction and the end of the war and what these people went through and how they were uh, dehumanized in so many ways by the aftermath of, of, uh, of the war. And so at Christmas time, here we are, it's December 26th, the day after Christmas. At Christmas time, we remember that. There are people suffering among us now, and we should have Christian charity for those people. Remember that people all throughout the United States have suffered in different times at Christmas, and how their faith led them through those dark times, and how they came out of it okay, But it is a celebration of Christ Mass. It's a celebration of Christianity and the things that make Christianity what it is, and that's love and charity. And the South did it their way, and the North did it their way. Neither. Uh, You can't say maybe one is better than the other. Maybe we can. The secular holiday of Christmas has become so much different. But it was a hard time in 1864. And the gaiety was still there. The gaiety of the South was still there. And they made do with what they had. And so we should always remember that at Christmas time, and that there was a Southern Christmas, even in the darkest days of the war. And we can still have those things now. And that the cause of independence was not dimmed at that time in 64, they still believed in it. They still believed in it after the war was over. That is what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, this hope. The South had hope, and we should not lose that. The South had hope. It was not a depressing time. It could have been. But even in the darkest days of Reconstruction, the South still had hope. And Christmas could light that fire. Until next time, good day. Good day.